there's a lot more about 3D Lite than just being a fast CPU render. Stick around and I'll show you why. Hi, my name is Kays and welcome to another Rightbrain tutorial. So this is a bit of a continuation of my previous tutorial where I went into like the basics of 3D Lite rendering engine. And in this one, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the shading system of 3D Lite and show you all the cool things that you can do beyond just adding basic textures to your models. Okay, so here we are inside Houdini. This is uh, the render that I did uh, after the end of my last lesson on 3D Lite. I just kind of made it a little more interesting. So uh, let's do a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to get rid of this sidebar just to give us a little bit more room by clicking this key. Uh, I'm going to still keep our thumbnails down here, but I'm just going to make this a lot smaller for now. And I'm just going to put this aside so that we have a little bit more room here. I'm going to do another thing. Uh, here we are in the out context of Houdini into my 3D Lite ROP. So uh, because I want to move a lot faster, especially just to kind of show you guys a little bit of, you know, some of these shaders and some of these uh, other things that I want to show you, um, I want my IPR to be a lot more responsive and I want to be able to get previews a lot faster. So I want to show you something. Uh, there is a tab here called Overrides and if we click on this guy, we'll see that we can enable some speed boosting. Uh, basically, we can kind of reduce some of the rendering uh, elements, uh, quality, and so on and so forth on the fly in order to get a faster, more interactive sort of way of previewing our scenes. So I'm just going to enable interactive previewing with speed boost. That's going to make the render a lot faster. And then it gives me a couple of different options. Uh, you can uh, cut your resolution. You can keep it at full or half or quarter or eighth. In this particular case, because my camera is a 1080p, I'm just going to go down to half. So that's going to turn it into a 720p. And then as far as sampling is concerned, uh, I'm still like with the basic uh, default settings here, but I'm going to keep this maybe at like 25%. So instead of 64 shading samples, it will go to uh, a fourth of that. There's other things that we can do. We can kind of disable, well, let's disable the motion blur. We're not going to be dealing with motion blur. Uh, let's disable the depth of field. That's probably for another lesson. I'm going to show you how to do depth of field and motion blur. Um, we do want to uh, keep displacement enabled. Uh, let's keep subsurface enabled. Let's keep atmosphere and multiple scattering enabled for now. Okay. Let's go back into my... Uh, OBJ context and here all I did uh, from the last lesson is just basically create uh, just copy the grid and just kind of gave it this almost like kind of hollow cube and then I had my VDB in the middle that I uh, gave like a very very red coloration so we're not going to be dealing with the VDB right now I'm just going to click that off and also I don't really want these additional grids so I'm just going to uh, put all this stuff aside and focus rather on my plane down here. So let's frame that up uh, somewhere like this. This is our grid and right now our uh, texture map is being mapped once across you know in both the horizontal and the vertical of our grid here. Let me just kind of zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Okay, so our texture is not repeating at all. Our texture right now is exactly mapped out so that it extends from this side to that side just once and from the bottom to the top just once. Okay, so we don't have any UV repetition. This texture is being scaled to match our grid. But what if we wanted to have some UV Repetition. What if we want to repeat the tiles because maybe um, we want, you know, maybe, maybe this grid is a lot bigger and uh, and this feels out of scale. So the first tool that 3D Lite gives us in order to address UV tiling is actually like a UV node, which uh, you will find, I guess, like under the utilities UV. Yeah, right here. Okay. A lot of rendering engines actually require this external node to change the sizing, rotation, and scale of the UV tiles. Uh, Redshift does not. Redshift actually builds this right into the texture node. However, 
3D Lite follows a more standard kind of way of doing things, so it does require an external UV node. There is advantages, however, and the main advantage is that once we plug this UV uh, from, we're going to go from the out UV into the UV coordinate inputs. The nice thing about doing it this way is that now we have a single way that we control all of the maps that are being applied to our geometry. Because if you're in Redshift, for instance, and you have like texture nodes, every texture node has a scale parameter, rotation parameter for your UVs, um, then what tends to happen is that you change one of your texture nodes and then you have to go in and change it for all of your other texture nodes, okay? So normals, roughness, displacement, specular, metallic, and so on and so forth. So let's see what happens, for instance, if we decide to repeat this texture twice. So twice in the horizontal and twice in the vertical. We're just gonna click here under repeat U, and we're gonna type two, and then same thing in the V. I'm gonna put repeat two. So now all of a sudden we have two repetitions of our textures, one, two, in the horizontal and two repetition in the vertical, one, two. So effectively, we are seeing four copies of our original texture tile, okay? So far so good, we can increase this number as well. Say we want it to be eight and eight, and we have a lot more repetitions in our grid. Here, I'm just gonna make this a little bit larger so you can kind of see, like, you know, the, the very, very recognizable tiling pattern that we're starting to see right now. We can also go the other way. We can make less repetitions. So maybe we want to go 0.5 and 0.5. So now only half of our original 4K texture is actually being shown on our grid. Okay, so there's a whole other half on this side and there's a whole other half above it. Uh, let's go back to, uh, let's go like two and two for right now, just to kind of show the basics. Uh, we can also rotate it. So we have, uh, a rotation, uh, let's say we can kind of go, um, well, let's go like 45 degrees, so now everything should be kind of uh, heading that way, uh, we can go like 90 degrees, so basically we kind of squared it off and it's kind of pointing the other way and so on and so forth. I mean this is all pretty standard, but I just wanted to show you that you can do all of those things within the UV node of 3D Lite. There are some additional functions, such as like this mirroring, uh, where we can kind of actually flip the textures. So now we have, I don't know if you can kind of see it, but we have like a bit of a mirroring pattern being applied. So the textures are not like repeating back and forth, but they're actually kind of being flipped. This can help to kind of reduce some of the tiling effects. Uh, we have a few other options like butterfly and like random. Uh, so, you know, this could be really, really powerful to help you avoid any repetition in your texture. Okay, but what if you need a high density repetition? Okay, let's, let's make this fairly crazy. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so that you can kind of see this a little more clearly. So now we can see that we have this repetition, okay? Like our texture map is being repeated 16 times across and 16 times vertically, okay? So now we have this very recognizable pattern that we all dread, especially when we're doing a lot of repetition, which is called tiling. And tiling is typically a, like, not a desired type of thing because the human eye is very perceptive to pattern repetition, okay? And anything that looks like a pattern will feel very artificial to us because in nature typically we don't really have patterns okay so if you look at uh, you know look out the window you will see that it's very difficult to see a repeating uh, pattern that's exactly the same uh, this is true even for buildings by the way which you know you could kind of say well you know this building has uh, you know all of the floors look exactly the same so you have like all these windows that are kind of staggered that might be true but each window is slightly different right like so you might have like different curtain sets in the different windows or you might have like some stains or maybe like a window is open and the other one is not and, and so on and so forth. Well, 3D Lite actually gives us an incredibly powerful method to do away with tiling or at least with the perception of tiling, which is a form of texture bombing. And if I understand it correctly, what 3D Lite is actually doing is that it's randomly rotating and 
possibly even randomly scaling the texture throughout each and every one of these 16 repetitions, for instance. And then it's blurring between them to help confuse the eye so that we don't really pick up a pattern. Let me show you how you enable it. So for this one, you do have to go into your texture nodes, okay? So we're gonna have to do this for each of these three texture nodes that I have here. So you'll see here that there's a tile removal tab and all we have to do is just enable this checkbox and you'll see right away that the moment I do that, uh, we're starting to kind of get like a little bit more randomness to our, um, you know, to our pattern. Now, right now, we're still detecting the pattern because I haven't done that to the roughness. So let me enable it in the roughness. And last but not least, let me enable it, most importantly, in the displacement, okay? So now that I've enabled it in all three nodes, you can see what's happening to our grid. And it's really quite amazing. To me, when, uh, when I realized I could do this in 3D Lite, it's when I was completely sold. I'm like, oh my god, like, I don't understand why this is not a thing for all renders, but as far as I know, 3D Lite is the only render that you can do this right off the bat that's actually built into the nodes. Uh, I think there's ways that you can do it in other renders, but you have to kind of resort to some other tricks. Okay, so let's go back to a more basic thing. I removed our UV repetition. I'm not gonna deal with that right now. And I've also removed our tile removal, just because I wanna show you a couple of other things before we moved on to some other shaders. So we have a color correction tab under our texture node that allows for some adjustment, but it's not the same type of color correction that you might be thinking about. Uh, for that, we do have a color correct node. We have an image sequence. If you want to use an image sequence, this makes it a lot easier than if you saw my tutorial about uh, using $F to access like you know, uh, image sequences for your files. Well, by enabling this guy, you can actually kind of pick uh, frame numbers, frame offsets, and it's just like that much easier to set up. Rather, the other adjustment that I do want to show you guys, because it might be necessary in some cases, is the color space. So color space is a bit of a difficult, you know, complex subject for a lot of people. And basically it has to do with how a, um, you know, the, the, the values of the pixels are represented uh, for different types of color spaces and file formats. And typically you are dealing with uh, linear representation, uh, sRGB, which is used on most computer monitors. Rec. 709 is the third way, which is kind of like traditionally understood as what you see on television, okay? So those are different color spaces. In 99% uh, of the cases, I found that just leaving things on auto is going to result in the proper interpretation of what the color space of the original color space of the texture is just so you know typically when you're dealing with jpegs uh, or png typically you're dealing with like either an srgb or rec 709 however you start getting into exr and sometimes even some tiffs and you might be dealing with a linear color space as I said, I mean, that I could make a whole tutorial just about color spaces. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm just going to say that uh, if you leave this on auto, it should work most of the time. However, if you're looking at your texture and it just doesn't really look like what you were expecting, maybe from, you know, maybe you downloaded something from a, a Quixel and, uh, and you're looking at their previews and then you're looking at your previews and your previews look kind of weird or washed up or the colors are kind of different or something like that, you might want to try adjusting this color space setting, you know, to something like linear, for instance, or uh, sRGB. All right, so what else does 3D Lite give us in terms of shaders? For this next example, I am opting to use something a little bit more complex than just the regular grid. I have this object from the Video Copilot uh, collection. I'm just going to call it Gizmo, and I've already created a new material in 3D Lite. So let's see here. If I right click, I see that in my 3D Lite uh, pull down menu, 
I have a bunch of uh, really cool notes here. This is kind of like uh, our basic shaders. And then I have like some utilities. I have patterns 3D, regular patterns. And then last but not least, I have this add-ons subcategory. Don't worry about that right now because you probably won't see it in your install of 3D Lite. This is where you can put some open shading language or OSL shaders that you can kind of download from third parties. And I'll probably do another tutorial to show you how to install those in 3D Lite. So uh, looking here at our base level, we have an atmosphere node. Uh, let's not worry about that right now. That's how you create some fog in your scene. Let's take a look instead of this car paint node, okay? So if I instance this guy, I'm just gonna plug it into our surface. Uh, let's start by giving it a base, uh, I don't know, let's pick orange, just to have like some something that's a little bit more exciting than white. And I'm just going to click render, bring up our IPR. And what we have here is your basic car paint type of shaders. And right now we can't really see it as well. Here, let me, let me zoom in a little bit and just kind of enable the IPR function of it. We can't really see it very well, but we actually have a lot of flakes in as part of this paint, as well as having a clear coat on the outside. So... Um, let me go under the flakes um, tab and let's change the color to something we can see, maybe this kind of uh, bright blue. And right now we have like a lot of flakes, so it actually kind of looks like noise to me. Uh, let's make the density a little bit lower. Let's try like 0.1. Eh, we can go even less dense, probably 0 0.01. Let's see. We can adjust the roughness, we can adjust the scale, so maybe if we want larger flakes. Let's put like a 0.5 and now we have this really, really nice, uh, very visible uh, car paint flakes in our car paint shader. Uh, and then we have a coating. Right now the thickness is pretty small, but we can kind of put the thickness to say 0.1. So that gives us a bit of a, like a thicker clear coat on our car paint. And of course we can also change the color that our outer clear coat layer has. So maybe if it has something like green, then our clear coat is, is kind of going to give this like green kind of shading, especially on the reflection. All right, let's keep going. So next we have a glass material, okay? A glass shader. I'm just going to plug this into our surface. I'm just going to hit render and we have this really really gorgeous glass material now don't let the name glass confuse you on top of using this material on any sort of objects that you want to be transparent this is also what you would use when you have water so if you're doing oceans if you have like rivers or anything of that sort you would also want to use the glass shader to give you that kind of transparency and of course you have adjustments such as IOR and roughness and reflection and volumetric incandescence and you can also plug bump normal or displacement maps into any of these shaders. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, down the list we have a hair and fur shader. I'm gonna probably leave this for like a future tutorial. I'm not really set up for hair and fur right now with this object, but just do know that it's there. And rather what I want to show you next is the metal shader. So metal shader is a really easy to use and very powerful way of getting some gorgeous looking metals onto your geometry. Right now the default setting uh, gives you this uh, really beautiful copper uh, type of material. And the reason why is because if we go under the metal layer, you'll see that we have uh, some color settings for color and edge color, which are, you know, a little bit more on the pinkish kind of copper. So if you want something that's more traditional, say stainless steel or aluminum, then we would just kind of change this to, you know, like some gray values, uh, maybe gray and light gray and hit render. And this is going to give us a more traditional steel type of shading material. In addition to that, there is anisotropy settings that uh, describe, you know, like the kind of brushiness of the metal and how like the reflections are affected. But uh, what I also wanted to show you guys is this checkbox right here that's called tempered metal. And this is really, really cool. So check out when I enable and hit render, we have this really, really beautiful, colorful reflections in the metal. And I haven't really seen this in other render engines that, you know, as a built-in 
sort of function and I think it's really really cool the 3D light has it as a built-in option and of course we can change some of the settings like the oxide thickness for instance to get variations of how these colors almost kind of like this kind of psychedelic rainbow sort of colors are you know affect the reflections of the metal so the metal shader is really really cool and really powerful and extremely easy to use okay so next I'm going to show you the 3d light skin shader now this is probably not the best geometry to demonstrate the skin shader but uh, it will give you an idea of what it does I mean obviously it um, it's a very useful type of shader when you're doing human skin and even alien skin since you can change the color uh, the subsurface scattering is way too high for this particular geometry and as I said this is not the right object to demonstrate this particular shader but it will give you an idea of what it does now keep in mind that you have subsurface scattering on the principled shader node as well but this is a more specialized node specifically geared towards skin shading applications Okay, I'm not going to go through every single shader also because in all fairness I am not really familiar with some of these more specialized shaders for instance uh, the thin shader I've never actually used myself uh, my understanding is that you would use something that has translucency such as uh, plant leaves for instance or maybe uh, thin paper or something like that so I'm not extremely familiar with it but do know that it's an option and it's here what I do want to show you guys, however, is the Tune Shader because 3D Lite does have a built-in Tune Shader. So let's plug this guy right here and if I hit Render right now, um, it doesn't look like much, right? So you're like, eh, is this really Tune? It's not really looking like Tune. Well, let's make a couple of little tweaks. First of all, I'm just going to push this um, uh, more specular type of value a little bit higher. But most importantly, I'm going to go into the outlines and what I want to do is I want to change the color uh, of the outlines to black and also I'm going to do a couple of other things here I'm going to enable our folds and creases and maybe I'm just gonna make the width a little bit uh, a little bit smaller 0 .005, 0 0.005 for all of them so that they're not quite as thick of lines so if I hit render now you'll start seeing that now this looks a lot more like a hand-drawn type of object. Uh, here maybe I can kind of change the angle a little bit and give you a little bit of a better idea of what the Tune Shader is doing. So um, right now it's it's got like some fairly basic kind of uh, adjustments here as I showed you it's just like basically you have like shading colors, uh, you have like some uh, other like kind of adjustments for like the highlights and the fuse and the specular weights and then we have our outlines with the various thickness my understanding is that the guys that are you know the 3d light guys the geniuses that have created this uh, render engine are currently working to implement some more advanced tune shading features so keep your eyes out in a future revision of 3d light which hopefully will add some additional features that will come in really handy if you need to do tune shading for your rendering. Okay, there's tons more that I could show you about 3D Lite, but maybe I'm gonna have to do a third video because I don't really want this video to turn into like this multi-hour massive sort of thing. But I did want to show you a couple of other nodes that I use all the time and that you might find handy as you're getting to know 3D Lite. So uh, let's go back to a principled shader Okay, and maybe just kind of assign it, uh, I don't know, it's just a basic dark blue color for right now. I'm just going to hit render just to see where we're at. Okay, so that's what we have. So the first thing I want to show you guys is some noises that 3D Light comes with. So um, you might be tempted to look for a noise under the patterns and you would find noise here however if you plug this guy in you're probably not gonna see what you were expecting to see so let me just plug this guy in and there is something happening here with uh, some kind of darker shaders and wider shaders but this is probably not the noise that you were looking for so to find a more traditional type of noise we want to go under the patterns 3D subsection of 3D light and here you'll find different types of nodes such as the Brownian noise I think I'm pronouncing that correctly 
So if we fire this guy up, we'll see that we get a little bit more of the traditional type of noise that we're all used to. So we can kind of fine tune, uh, you know, say for instance the lacunarity. Let's maybe make that six and we should get to see some kind of more higher frequency type of noise. Uh, we do have additional other noise. So let's see here. I can show you the cloud noise. Let's plug that into the color and fire it up. And right now it's really, really sparse and hard to see. So let me maybe um, increase the ratio. Let's make it 0.1 and maybe I just kind of, I don't know, increase the contrast a little bit and let's hit render and see what that gives us. So cloud gives us this more type of, a little bit more fractally, fractally looking type of noise. Uh, we do have a solid fractal noise as well that we can kind of plug in here. And once again, I'm just gonna change the ratio to maybe like 0.1, I'm gonna hit render. Okay, let's get rid of some of these thumbnails. And it gives us this type of noise. So as you can see, like there's different types of noises that you can use in 3D light that allow you to, you know, both add noise to your object or maybe you want to use them as masks. So on that note, let me show you how we can use noise as a mask for materials. So what I have here is a principled um, shader node that we set up. Uh, and as I said, this is just like our basic uh, blue uh, paint coat, which I called paint right here. And then what I've done is I've created a metal shader okay and what I want to do and this metal shader is just like your basic kind of stainless steel sort of surface and what I want to do is I want to be able to have this metal paint to kind of show that it's kind of worn out in places and you can kind of see the metal underneath okay so we're gonna do that by using a 3d light layered node okay so layered node is a node that allows you to have different type of shaders plugged into the same layer and then uh, use something like a noise to drive which shader you're actually seeing in the final product. So I'm going to take the layer material, I'm going to plug it into from the out color into the surface input of our terminal node and then I'm going to take the paint and I'm just going to plug the out color to the eye color input here and the metal I'm gonna put into the middle layer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some, a concept that's pretty important in 3D light and 3D light shaders. What we have here is we have an out color from our fractal noise, as well as this RGB and then an alpha channel, okay? So the out color is, uh, contains like three different values. It contains a value for red, for green, and for blue which uh, in some cases can be re uh, referred to as a vector value, which usually has like three different numbers to describe, you know, um, the information. These other outputs, which have a bit of a, a lighter kind of greenish teal sort of color, those are float outputs and they typically describe a zero to one value, which is typically a grayscale value, okay? So whenever we're using inputs that are typically relying on this type of float value, then we wanna use some of these outputs of the node. And whenever we're in, we wanna use a, uh, a more of a vector or RGB sort of value, then we would use the out color. So in this particular case, in the layered material, you will see that because of the color, the color is telling us that for masks, this particular node wants to see a float value. So what we're gonna wanna do is grab one of these RGB outputs from the noise solid fractal nodes to plug into one of those masks. Now, if we go back to our noise render, you'll see that our noise is grayscale anyway. Uh, there's a little bit of like kind of yellow thing. This is simply the reflection of our HDRI. So don't worry about this. We're typically dealing with a grayscale uh, zero representing 100% black to one which represents 100% white. Uh, so for all intents and purposes this is a float shader anyway and even though it does have like an out color right now we're not really using it. 
So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the color from one of those guys and you can typically just go with like the red channel which is fine in this particular case. And we're gonna plug it into the top mask right here. So now that we have this solid fractal noise to drive the mask of our layered material nodes, now if we hit render you'll see what we get which is our desired result which is this kind of paint that's worn out and now it's showing like the metal underneath the surface. However, we want to be able to adjust this mask a little bit more and the way that we would normally do this type of adjustments in a render engine such as Redshift for instance is with a ramp node. So you might be tempted here let, let me let me go back to I'm just gonna for the sake of simplicity I'm just gonna plug this guy in here and I'm gonna plug this guy into the surface just so we can see the just the noise right now okay let's work on just the noise so what you might be tempted to do is right click and start typing ramp and you will see that we have two nodes that 3D Light gives us a ramp and a solid ramp and we plug this guy in and right off the bat you're gonna be wondering where am I gonna plug this guy in maybe the color value uh, you know it's a little bit kind of confusing and if we plug this guy into the color even with nothing plugged in and I just hit render you'll see that this is giving us something very very similar to that noise not the the noise 3d but the, the, the regular noise node okay so this is not really something that we're mostly used to dealing with and 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 as I said it's a uh, well, if you hit the spacebar by the way you'll play back all of your thumbnails in real time this is really really cool by the way if you are checking for your animation because you can just hit the spacebar and the 3d light display app will play back at full speed and it's it's really awesome it's so what can we do in order to have a node that gives us the same capabilities that are basically contrast adjustments for grayscale values in the form of a ramp like some of you guys might be used to from, as I said, Redshift. So neither of these ramp nodes are really gonna do a trick. What we really wanna use is this other node that is called a remap node, okay? So the remap node does exactly what a redshift ramp node would normally do. And it also gives you some much more understandable, at least like this says input, okay, input value. So let's plug our um, red output into the input value and let's plug this guy into the color for right now. So without doing anything and I'm just gonna hit render and let's just get rid of some of these thumbnails right here we will have the basic unadulterated noise as we saw before without this remap node however now we can adjust some of the settings so for instance I can kind of bump up the black uh, ramp and hit render again and we will see now that our black values are more pronounced or I could do the opposite I could kind of go into the white value and bump those up a little bit closer and now we can see that our white is more prominent into the noise. So the remap node as I said is how you're going to um, what you're gonna use when you want to adjust some of these masks and some of these float values and fine-tune them and I use the remap node a lot just like I used the ramp node in Redshift quite a lot. So now that we know that, let's go back to our layered material. Okay, just gonna hit render once again. And, uh, oh, let me get rid of, we don't want to drive our paint nodes with the noise right now. So I'm just gonna hit render again so we go back to our blue paint. And let me just kind of reset this to the default value so now that we have this guy plugged in I'm just simply gonna take this and plug into our top mask input of our layered material I'm just gonna hit render and now we are not gonna see any difference because as I said this is just like the default values 
let's go into IPR mode so at least we will get like some real-time updates and we'll be able to kind of see a little bit how this remap node allows us to fine-tune our mask so if I push this a little bit more this way then we will see that we have less of our blue paint showing and vice versa if I push this the other way and bring the high value now we'll see that we have more of the blue paint showing through and a little bit less of this kind of worn out uh, metal underneath uh, the object so I can kind of push this even further and I can kind of fine-tune it even more I mean I can kind of add like another node right here and just maybe adjust it and you can see that like we can get like some very very precise adjustment of, of our masks or really any other type of materials by using this remap node. So this remap node is very, very powerful. All right, I think I'm gonna stop here for today because as I mentioned, I don't want this video to turn into this crazy long multi-hour tutorial. Uh, but I did want to cover some of these additional shaders and nodes that I didn't get to cover in the introduction video to 3D Light that I did last. If you're evaluating 3D Lite, I would encourage you guys to test out all of the different nodes that are available. There's really a lot here and you can do some really, really powerful, amazing things with the nodes 3D Lite gives you. I should, however, mention that some nodes have not yet been implemented in 3D Lite for Houdini yet. Uh, for instance, Curvature is not yet available. Now, my understanding is that the 3D Light developers are actively looking to release these nodes as quickly as possible, so they're working on it, but as of the recording of this video, they're not yet present. However, I would recommend that you keep checking on the 3D Light website and look for updates, and hopefully they'll be coming to Houdini very soon. If you like this video, click like, hit subscribe, tell your friends, you know, all the fun stuff. And most importantly, let me know in the comments below uh, what you think about 3D Lite and what you would like to see next, both about 3D Lite or really any other subject that you would like for me to cover in a future tutorial. So on that note, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.